All right, church. Well, John, Gospel of John chapter 2, let's go there. Um, as we do, two quick announcements for you. Number one, I mentioned this last week, but if you're newer to the church, I'd love to give you one of these uh, scripture journals for the Gospel of John. It's just the text of the Gospel of John with some room for making notes so that as we go through this series, you have both the text and sort of a, a way to capture thoughts. And so if you want to come see me afterwards, I'd love to give you one of those um, for those of you that are newer to the church. Second, um, we are going to do a baptism here in about three or four weeks on September 19th. And so if you have professed faith in Jesus Christ and you're ready to be baptized, I'd love to connect you and walk with you toward that day and toward that profession publicly of identification with Jesus and his people. So if you'll come see me after the service, I'd love to just jot down your name and, and we'll get you going in that process so that you can celebrate and be baptized on the 19th of September. Um, so more information forthcoming about the, the when and the how of that, but I um, wanted to get the word out to you so that you can um, let us know if you're ready to be baptized. Let's turn our attention then uh, to the Gospel of John. And one of the key features in all four Gospels, as you know, is that they record Jesus doing miracles, like turning water to wine, for instance. And for most of human history, that hasn't been a super controversial thing. However, in about the past two or 300 years, people have grown increasingly skeptical of miracles, right? After all, we live in a rationalistic, scientific age. Uh, philosophers like David Hume have convinced us or tried to convince us that miracles aren't possible. And skeptics have told us that miracle stories were just a way that pre-modern people made sense of phenomena that they couldn't explain with their worldview. And we modern Americans, after all, have reached the pinnacle of human understanding. We are finally on the right side of history and everything, and we've moved beyond all that superstition and myth and tradition, right? Well, I'm not going to bother making an argument for miracles because I think that the the arrogance of modernism is becoming more and more evident, right? For all that it seeks to explain, there's a lot that modernism just doesn't have the tools to explain. And here we are, modern people who are skeptical of miracles, and yet you guys want me to do a podcast on aliens, right? <laughs> we modern people still believe in unexplainable things. We just like to pick and choose which unexplainable things we find credible. The reality is, Obviously, if there's no God, then there are no miracles. And on the other hand, if there is a God, then of course, God can intervene in history in ways that surprise us. That should not be amazing. After all, as Christians, we profess and believe in the incarnation, as we talked about a few weeks ago, that God took on human flesh. And of course, if God has done that, then it is not a very big deal for God to turn water into wine or to make blind people see, or to make lame people walk. The important thing for us as we think about miracles is less that we consider them to be possible or feasible. It's actually quite significant and more important that we understand the reason for Jesus' miracles and for why the gospel writers record them. Now, most of us have been taught, or maybe we haven't been taught, we just sort of took into our minds somehow that Jesus' miracles are like a messianic mic drop, right? This is just like Jesus flexing on his critics and showing his power. That's sort of, I think, how we conceive of <clears throat> the miracles of Jesus. Well, John wants to show us that there's way more going on than just a bare display of divine power. In fact, notice the word, <clears throat> excuse me, that John uses in chapter 2, verse 11, to describe the miracle of turning water into wine. He says this, the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. <clears throat> now, what does a sign do? A sign points to something, right? It identifies something. When you drive by out here on Pacific Street and you see the sign that says Coram Deo Church, that sign is pointing you to the building, and actually pointing you beyond the building to the people who make up Coram Deo Church. If the sign didn't exist, that wouldn't change the reality that there is a church here. The sign points beyond itself to something more important and more significant. So when we read this account of Jesus turning water into wine, 
What John wants us to ask is, what is this pointing us to? What is this signifying? What's the bigger and more important thing that this is showing us? And once we start asking that question, all of a sudden the little details of the story start to matter in new ways. Of all possible settings, why does Jesus perform this first miracle at a wedding? Of all possible vessels, why stone water jars used for Jewish rites of purification? Of all possible responses, why does the head steward at the wedding emphasize the fact that Jesus' wine is better than the wine that was there before? It turns out this whole scene is an acted out parable. Jesus is not interested in just doing a neat magic trick. Jesus is saying something about who he is and about what he's come to do. And so to see the bigger story that Jesus is telling, the bigger story that John wants us to connect, let's step back into the Old Testament for a few minutes. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to read you five passages from the Old Testament prophets I just want you to sit back and listen and hear and pay attention to the imagery, the word pictures, the descriptions, the metaphors that the prophets of the Old Testament use. Passage number one, Isaiah 62, verses one through five. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. Verse 4. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her. And your land married for the Lord delights in you. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Passage number two, Hosea six, or sorry, Hosea two, verses sixteen through twenty. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Passage number three, Isaiah 55, verses one through three. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine. And milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 8. We just sang it a minute ago. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. Finally, Amos chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel 
and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. These are five of dozens and dozens of passages like this in the prophets. All these Old Testament images of brides and bridegrooms and weddings, of wine and vineyards and feasting, these were the images the prophets used to paint a picture of what the Messianic age would be like, of what things would be like when God visited his people to restore their fortunes and to bring his kingdom. So Jesus stands up at a wedding when the wine has run out and turns water into wine. And what Jesus is saying as he does that is that that age that the prophets spoke of is here now. The Messiah has arrived, writes commentator Gary Burge, and the Messianic banquet has begun. Judaism's vessels of purification are now being filled with new things. The wine that has been served already is exhausted, and Jesus' new wine is replacing it. Do you need purification? Well, of course you do. But you need much more than that. Right? The reality of sin is that sin defiles us. It makes us unclean. Deep down, we feel the need to be cleansed from things we've done and from things that others have done to us. And cleansing, as good as it is, can't make us new. Jesus can The Old Testament rituals of purification give way to the new wine of the kingdom of God. Jesus will cleanse his people from sin once and for all through his death on the cross, and then he will pour out the new wine of his spirit on his people to make them radically new, to take them beyond what mere rituals of purification could accomplish. In Jesus, the water of purification is turned into the wine of joy and feasting and fullness. So where has the wine run out in your life? Where has the hope dried up? Where has the joy vanished? Will you let Jesus meet you there in that place? That's only the first story in the chapter. Right on the heels of that story, now John wants us to take us to another setting that is also charged with significance. And so he takes us to this next scene, verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the temple in Jerusalem was the center of Jewish life, politically and religiously and socially in every way. The original temple had been built by Solomon and then was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. And about 20 years before the birth of Christ, Herod the Great, the Roman governor of Judea, had begun this massive rebuilding campaign. It was the largest construction project in the ancient world. And on the one hand, it was a very pragmatic decision. Uh, Herod was not well liked by the Jewish people, and so this was his way of trying to curry some political favor with them. It was that temple, Herod's temple, that Jesus enters in this scene. The temple was a sacred space. It was the place where people went to encounter God. It was the place where heaven and earth came together, where God met with human beings, and where God's people went to experience his presence. It was sort of the meeting place of heaven and earth, if you want to think of it that way. In the book of 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament, we read what happened when Solomon dedicated the first temple, the very first one that he had built. Second Chronicles 7, 
tells us this, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. Solomon built the temple, and then God's glory filled the temple. And so when you came to the temple, you were coming to the presence of God, the place where God dwelt. But what had happened in Jesus' day is the same thing that happens in your life and in my life. The glory of encountering God had slowly been replaced by religious routine. Happens to us, doesn't it? On my best days, I'm up here preaching with a deep joy in the Lord and a prayerful passion that we will meet with the living God as we hear his word together. And there's also not so great days when this is what I do. Sunday, I got to get up here and preach because this is my job. And I can say that because you're the same way, aren't you? There's moments, there's times when you come into this room desperate to encounter God, really needing to meet with God in a personal way. And there's other days when this is just what we do. It's easy for this just to become the thing we do. At Passover, God had said each family was to offer a sacrifice to the Lord, and every Jewish man was to pay a half shekel to help fund the temple. And so what that means is buying an animal for sacrifice and exchanging money to get the right coinage were part of what needed to happen. It's not that money changers or pigeon sellers are inherently evil. It's that a focus on encountering God had been replaced by a focus on doing the things. I want you to see how serious worship is to Jesus. He's turning tables over and driving people out. He's causing a scene and making a ruckus. And and what he says is, do not make my father's house a house of trade. What Jesus cares about is that you encounter his Father. And if you go through all the mechanics of worship, if you show up and do the things and miss the Father, then you've missed everything. But the story doesn't end there. Look at verse 18. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? which is an interesting question. It means that they probably, they didn't ask, hey, what are you doing? They didn't grab him and kick him out of the temple. There's a sense in which even their own consciences were provoked. Because like us, they probably knew, yeah, this has kind of become routine. What he's doing is probably what someone should do around here. What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. If it's taken a while for the teaching of Jesus to make sense to you, You're in good company. What Jesus said in this moment only actually made sense to the disciples after the resurrection. Like what John is saying is Jesus said this and no one got it at the time. And then after the resurrection, we were standing around going, hey, hang on a second. Do you remember what he said? This is that, right? That's when the lights came on. That's when they realized what he meant. The temple Jesus was talking about, John tells us as he looks back, was the temple of his body. In other words, Jesus himself is the true temple. Jesus himself is the place where heaven and earth meet. Jesus himself is the place where we encounter the presence of God. 
Where do you go to meet with God now? You go to Jesus. How do you worship God now? You worship God through Jesus. Jesus is saying, my body, this flesh and blood right here, this is the temple. This beautiful thing that Herod built, it's great. But this is no longer where you go to encounter the presence of God. The presence of God is right here. And by the way, if we will pay attention here, Jesus is teaching us how to read the Bible. Listen to how Don Carson explains it. This is an important category. He writes, we're inclined to think of prophecy as verbal prediction that is fulfilled when the event predicted by the prophecy has come to pass. But there is ample evidence that some things predicted in the Old Testament were not set out as verbal predictions, but as pictures, events, people, institutions. For example, the sacrifices mandated by the Mosaic law included some built-in features that forced the thoughtful reader to expect a sacrifice beyond themselves. The law anticipated a holiness from the heart. The system of priests looked forward to a perfect mediator. David and his kingdom announced in their very being the promise of a perfect David. The temple itself pointed forward to a better and final meeting point between God and human beings. There's more going on in the Old Testament than just verbal prophecy. There's all kinds of pictures and people and institutions that in their very existence are telling you, expect something more. And when you understand that, your reading of the Old Testament takes on a whole new significance. So, Jesus brings better wine, and Jesus is a better temple. That's what John is showing us in these two stories, and after telling us both these stories, John ends the chapter by drawing a very important contrast for us between believing and believing. John wants you to see there's two kinds of believing. There's two ways you can believe in Jesus. Look, first of all, at verse 22. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Look at verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people. And needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. There's a little play on words here in the text. It literally says, many believed in him, but he didn't believe them. It's like, the question isn't really, do you believe in Jesus? It's, does Jesus believe you? It's kind of the little joke that John is making here. So what was the difference between the false belief of these people in Jerusalem and the true belief of the disciples? That's what John wants you to see. The difference is in who you understand Jesus to be. The people at the, fast, at the Passover feast believed, it says, when they saw the signs he was doing. The people in Jerusalem liked the stuff Jesus could do. Jesus turned water into wine. Jesus went off on those greedy money changers. This is going to make our lives better. We need this guy around. For them, Jesus was a means to an end. Now, they might have all had different expectations of what they wanted Jesus to be or what they hoped Jesus could do for them. And the point was, Jesus for them was just a way of reinforcing whatever their original expectations were. And there are many people in our day who believe in Jesus kind of that way, right? Jesus is a means to an end. Jesus is going to give me a better life in some way. That's a kind of belief, but it's not biblical faith. What does true belief look like? What does real biblical faith look like? We'll look at verse 22 again. The disciples, it says, believed the scripture 
and the word that Jesus had spoken. In other words, their encounter of Jesus, rather than just fitting into their pre-existing expectations of what a great leader should be like, their experience of Jesus made them go back and ask, what does this mean about what we've always thought? Like, how does the person of Jesus re make us rethink everything? And they went back and looked again at the scriptures and saw with new eyes, oh, yeah, yeah, I see what's happening here. In other words, the disciples didn't just see what Jesus could do and think that was cool. They saw who he was. They saw that Jesus was the Messiah, the son of David, the heavenly temple, the bridegroom, the word made flesh. They believed the scriptural witness about Jesus. They understood Jesus the way Jesus taught them to understand him because they made the connection between Jesus, the word made flesh, and the scriptures, the word of God. And notice it was the resurrection that connected the dots for them. The resurrection was the thing that caused them to look back on everything Jesus had said and done and to see it with new eyes. They, they were sort of, as they're living life alongside Jesus, they're kind of filing away all these moments and these things that he says that seem kind of cryptic. They don't entirely make sense and He's making these connections to the Old Testament that don't exactly dawn on them. And then after the resurrection, they take all that pool of material and they go, okay, what does all this mean? And all of a sudden, all of it begins to connect and make sense. They see with new eyes the things that Jesus had said and done. And that's the same journey John is taking us on. We're going to get to the resurrection in chapter 20. But along the way, John just wants you to pay attention to the signs. He just wants you to take note of all the signs so that when you get to the resurrection, there's a lot of material for you to think back on and go, oh yeah, I've seen all these things that have kind of been pointing us in this direction. When I was a kid, we went on a lot of vacations to South Dakota because my grandparents lived there and uh, we usually were in the car because South Dakota's not that far away, as you know, and it's hard to get a flight anywhere in South Dakota. So you drive there. And if you've ever taken a car trip through the state of South Dakota, what you've noticed are the immense amount of billboards for a place called Wall Drug. Have you guys experienced this? You're driving through South Dakota. There's billboards every 20 miles for hundreds and hundreds of miles saying, have you seen Wall Drug? And I remember as a kid just sitting in the car and, and you know, you notice a billboard. You're like, okay, cool, it's a billboard. And then you see another one, and then you see another one, and then you see another one. And sooner or later, you're like, hey, Dad, what is this wall drug these signs speak of? Like, what is this place, right? And as a kid, you know, the signs work because they build anticipation and expectation. And after sitting in the car for 300 miles, seeing signs every 20 miles for wall drug, you're like, hey, we have got to see this place. You cannot pass this exit for wall South Dakota. We have got to go here. We've got to see what this is, right? Which is the whole genius of the advertising strategy, it's the whole genius of all the billboards is they build this anticipation so that when you get to the exit, you're like, I have got to see this. Well, that's kind of what John's doing. He's just putting a bunch of signs together for you that are pointing you toward the resurrection, toward Jesus' cross and resurrection, and the signs are all building anticipation. You go, I, I, don't, I don't quite get all this stuff about Messiah and King of David and temple and new wine. I'm not sure what all that is, but I've got to see where this is taking us going to see what's at the end of this journey. That's the journey that John is taking us on. And in chapter 2, he, he just wants you to put these two things into the equation. Jesus brings better wine, and Jesus is a better temple. So don't just be awed by the signs you see Jesus doing. Don't just be one of those people who believes in Jesus because of what Jesus can do for you. Rather, believe the scriptures and the word Jesus has spoken. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, not just for your raw power that allows you to do things that confound us, but thank you more importantly for the signs, the things you are saying, the ways these are pointing us to who you are and what you have come to do. Thank you for the scriptures that predicted your coming 
Thank you for your fulfillment of those scriptures. Thank you that as we sit here this morning, the new wine of the kingdom of God is held out to us. So might we taste and see who you are, the reality of your goodness and your beauty, and of the cleansing and joy that only you can provide for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.